When I first came to the academy, I don't know, 10 years ago uh, in Carmel, this gentleman with a head of hair got up there, and I said, gosh, I wish I could get some of that. <laughs> but in all seriousness, he gave a lecture on connecting the teeth to the body, which was new to me at the time. And I had more questions than I could ever ask. I, we didn't have enough time that weekend. And he said to me, you know, Mike, if you got a question, just give me a call. I think he was sorry, because I would call numerous, numerous times. And even when he was busy, once he said I was busy, I can't talk now, but call me back, and I did. And he spent hours of his time, never compensated for it, other than a thank you here and there. And he has shown us so much over the years and has never asked for anything in return. Thank you for everything, Ara. All right. I practiced 32 years. I'm starting my 33rd year pretty soon. And uh, I'm in love with what I do. Started, my dad was a physician and a dentist. So I had a head start over a lot of people. And he happened to be a European type practitioner which connected the body to the teeth, you became a physician first, then a dentist second. So I've been very interested in pain management from day one because my mom used to have terrible headaches. So after I graduated in the early 70s, the first weekend I started taking courses by Niles Giche, uh, Peter K. Thomas, some of you are old enough to remember, all the occlusal courses, etc. cetera. And, uh, to a point that I exhausted everything till I met, uh, and then I got into Jenkinson's, my amateur stuff, which I'll show you in a minute. My life totally changed when I met this lady called Janet Travell. And as a matter of fact, finally after 25 years of work and a lot of expenses, I just finished the concept of dental medicine office. I have an office that includes medicine and dentistry. I've always, I've, the last 17 years I've had a physician, licensed physician work for me. Now I have two MDs, one ND and one Chinese physician. And a couple of you have been to my office. Yeah, and actually currently my office, we went into renovations. And my last gift to the, to the planet, I call it, is education, so I constructed a room to teach my patients and anybody, that's our only hope to get rid of disease, education. Uh, the lectures this afternoon really helped me a lot because I was so disappointed I'm going to talk about myofascial pain management. This is very, very old fashioned lecture is gonna be, but certain things you cannot change. How many of you, do my fascial therapy here. Okay. Okay. How many of you think it works? Hmm. How many of you think that uh, you could my fascial pain does not come back? Well, good. You're smart. <laughs> uh, my fascial pain management is very intricate. If you don't do the basics, you miss the boat. And hopefully today. I will teach you the basics because Janet Travell did not let me touch the needle before two years of training. Two years, okay? And you people think you're gonna go out and inject after an hour and a half of lectures. If Dr. King was in my office, he would shiver because the only reason I did what I did, I do what I do because I, bro I broke the law, I got into trouble and almost lost my license but I continue doing what I do and because I keep it very underground. Actually, when I got in trouble, it was not from my patient, it was from, again, insurance companies. It's always a third party that gets us in trouble. So, today we're gonna to talk about my fascial pain management, the continuation of the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system has a, as we call it in, the, in old medicine, the vegetative nervous system. It's brainstem, it's what we do all day long automatically. And it's divided into two components, sympathetic and parasympathetic, as you know. The reason I'm uh, 
decorating my talk because I'm going to connect it to physics, what we talked about this afternoon, the duality of matter and how the universe works in the macro system to the micro system and how myofascial work connects with, uh, with the macro and micro and osteopathy. I'm going to combine everything and center my talk today in the myofascial component. And the autonomic nervous system is dysregulated and that's how we get illnesses. This dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system creates all of our physical problems. And it's dysregulated. The pathways are structural, functional, biochemical, electromagnetic, and emotional. Today we're going to uh, stress the functional component, but I have to put the structural component and hopefully I will tie in the dental component, reconstruction to the functional component this afternoon. Now the dental component is dental focal infections, which we talked about all day today, the structural imbalances, the occlusal disharmonies, the functional dis imbalances, muscle, tendon, ligament, joint, etc., the biochemical and electrical imbalances, and this is an old slide, we missed the emotional components down behind here somewhere. So myofascial therapy which is the functional component. Pain from myofascial origin. Myofascial pain is neg neglected by modern medicine, and it is. I have seen people, actually, that do myofascial therapy. I've been to offices, but it's, Dr. Travell will not agree with them. Why is it neglected, I think, by modern medicine? Because it's tedious. It takes time. You have to spend a lot of time with your patient teaching them how to apply moist heat, stretch, talk about the perpetuating factors. Clinical characteristics of myofascial trigger points. Now you have to bear with me because this is the old fashioned part of the lecture. Pain referred from a trigger point. You see the local spot of tenderness, tense band of muscle, muscles are shortened, muscles are weak, and you have a local twitch response if you palpate properly. There are Phases of myofascial pain. Phase one is constant pain. Phase two is pain when the patient chews or walks. Phase three, latent, which I would really like to spend quite a bit of time on latent phase. And uh, people who raise their hand and they said, you know, it comes back. The problem is when we treat the patients and they think they felt better, we should continue treating them because there are many latent trigger points and last year in our lecture on, on drainage, I showed you how we do the drainages and how we treat over and over to get rid of the latent trigger points. And phase four is when you have no more trigger points. Myofascial pain refers to specific patterns and actually, once you get to know your patient, if you have, let's say, mis the muscle trapezius, on that patient it refers to the same reference zone as most of the patients, but once in a while, uniquely, the trapezius refers right to the leg. And I've had many patients, the soleus refers serious pain to the face. You do all the work you do, all the neurologists they've seen, uh, you go and inject the soleus out of my scope and the facial pain goes away. So, my facial pain has very unique reference zones. Characteristic of, of my facial pain, Dull and aching, deep, low grade, or some people are so incap incapacitated that they cannot function. They think they have cancer of the brain, etc. I've seen so many of those patients. And it's sometimes it's painful at rest of motion and can be increased by pressure on the trigger point. Okay, referred pain from myofascial trigger points does not follow a simple segmental pattern, does not follow a familiar neurologic pa pattern, does not follow known patterns of visceral origin. Pain extends over several segments. And hopefully later on when I talk about tensegrity and physics, we'll see why it goes over several segments. Myofascial pain frequently but not always occurs within the same dermatome, myotome, or sclerotome. It always includes, I find it, additional segments. Severity does not depend on the size of the muscle. Sometimes a muscle as small as a lateral pterygoid could create serious, serious pain from a trigger point in the lateral pterygoid muscle, as a lot of you have seen. 
So it's not the size that counts. Direct activation of myofascial pain is acute overload. People who have been clenching, they're stressed out, overwork, trauma, or you see some patients come, they went for a walk with a dog outside, it was cold, the wind blew on their face, and, and you know, they started the spasms, and it's actually that's what started the latent trigger points, activation of a latent trigger point that they were there for years, but they went out, they got chilled, and the trigger point came back. Indirect activation of myofascial pain. Other trigger points could reactivate the main trigger point. Visceral diseases. If you have somebody with gallbladder problems, the gallbladder refers to the zone, and the zone irritates the main trigger, and you have the problem. Visceral diseases, arthritic joints. If you have arthritis, it could trigger the trigger points again. Emotional disturbance is the the biggest of all, emotional disturbance. <coughs> all of the above could develop, especially um, myocardial infarctions, ulcers, gallbladder stones, kidney stones, they create satellite zones next to the main trigger. Now, you can only stop the pain completely when you are lucky enough to hit the main trigger. And injecting myofascial triggers is extremely extremely sophisticated because there are many layers of the fibers you have to know where to go when to go and there are also ways of injecting sequences of injecting for example it's very uh, easy for the uh, for the treatment if you inject the outer layers like the trapezius first and then go to the deeper layers you have to go into layers and segments Latent state of trigger points develop after adequate rest. So you treat a patient, they, they rest, and they say, oh, I'm fine now. I don't need any more treatments, and that's the problem. But those are the patients, they say, oh, I'm not going to ski anymore. I'm not going to golf anymore. They have changed their life because they did not take care of the latent trigger points. They think that the trigger point therapy was, was not good. You know, it, uh, it helped me a little bit. So you, there is huge benefit from myofascial treatment. 70% of all pain is from myofascial, but you have to take care of the perpetuating factors. You have to see people like Don or other physicians to help you to get rid of the perpetuating factors, or else the patient will say, I'm not gonna golf anymore because my elbow is hurting. It's usually referred pain most of the time because the x-ray showed no arthritis, or even if they show arthritis in the neck, anybody uh, over 40, if they take an x-ray of anybody's neck here, there is some form of degeneration. Perpetuating factors are mechanical stressors, nutritional ina ina inadequacies, metabolic and endocrine problems, which we have a, a huge amount now due to drug uh, pharmaceutical abuse of uh, medication, chronic infections, and impaired sleep, especially in my practice. If you don't sleep, you get trigger points, allergies, and chronic diseases. So sleep is, you can't sleep, you'll never get rid of your trigger points. Associated auto autonomic phenomena are lo localized vasoconstrictions, sweating. If you, if you notice when you treat uh, your patients and you hit the right trigger point, they start sweating. You have lacrimation, coryza, salivation, pilomotor activity and proprioceptive disturbances. You see people who, that are dizzy, when you increase the vertical dimension, get rid of the trigger points, the dizziness improves tremendously, or you get rid of it. Or sometimes if you get rid of the trigger points in the masseter muscle, the tinnitus goes away. Not always, but good success if you open up the vertical dimension, get rid of the trigger points in the masseter muscle and lateral pterygoid, medial pterygoid, a lot of times the tinnitus goes away, unless you have blood pressure problems. And also, especially imbalances. Patients come to see me from imbalance is amazing, uh, the, it, which is the second most important or uh, essential thing to do in life after breathing. Because if you ever have no balance, you can't get up and eat or shower or anything. The scariest patient I've seen are the people who have no balance. 
So you become a huge hero when you get back that balance. And uh, if you've seen uh, Dino's lecture a few years ago about the vertical dimension, so we've been doing that for years, increasing vertical dimension, how the balance comes back. That was, again, I had a lot of trouble with the board, why I was opening bytes the last 30 years. And I'll show you some slides if we have time. Disturbance of motor coordination. When you have trigger points, it creates, as I showed you earlier, motor, co motor coordination in the muscles of mastication. And some people cannot write properly, okay? Also, you could see when you do uh, trigger points or sprain stretch in the lower extremities, even the trapezius, you measure the mouth opening and you don't do any dental treatments or any splint. You do sprain stretch on the trapezius muscle, the vertical opening increases. So all other aspects of your body, as in the tensegrity model, which I'll show you later, affects the mouth as the mouth opening affects the rest of the body. I have studied osteopathy in quite a bit for many years, and just like myofascial treatment, now that we know physics and energy medicine, osteopathy and myofascial therapy is becoming clearer and clearer to me. And hopefully by the end of the day, it'll be, I'll help you out clarifying how it works. Diagnosis of myofascial pain. Sudden onset after acute or chronic overload. And also, you see, the, the main characteristic, you see loss of range of motion, weakness. You, see, you feel the taut palpable band with referred pain. When you palpate properly and you find that trigger point and you squeeze on it, the patient says, that's the pain. How come you get it? You're squeezing on my shoulder. I'm getting this frontal headache here and you are touching me here. If you spend the enough time and you adjust your fingers and you find that trigger point, you could duplicate the twitch response and the pain. Now, not everything is myofascial pain. There are lots of non-myofascial trigger points. Skin and scar, like uh, Dr. Turby mentioned today, and in neural therapy, you know how scars create trigger points, like distant pain from scars. Fascial and ligamentous uh, fascia and tendon muscles, joint, capsule, and ligaments, and periosteal trigger points. That's why we do prolotherapy, which is similar to myofascial therapy, the idea, but you are treating ligaments and periosteums and tendons with prolotherapy. And uh, I have lectured on prolotherapy, how we do prolon the jaws and et cetera. We have been doing prolotherapy at our office for over 15 years. Musculoskeletal diseases, myopathies, polymyositis, dermo dermatomyositis, arthritis, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, gout, psoriatic arthritis, inflammation, you could inject to the, till the cows come home. If the patient has these problems, you will never get rid of the myofascial problem. So myofascial therapy is not all the answer. You have to make sure you differential diagnose and these patients do not have musculoskeletal diseases. Then you have the neurological diseases like motor and sensory deficits, trigeminal neuralgia, sphenopalatine neuralgia, glossopharyngeal neuralgia, and Meniere's disease. These do not if you have these, you cannot help them with myofascial trigger point injections. And the viral diseases, the famous Lymes, herpes, and others. Bacterial diseases, strep, clostridia, and many others. And we have the infestations. So we have to differential diagnose and know that we don't have other factors. Now, examination. Examining the patient is extremely important. When the patient walks in your office, you look at the structural asymmetry, the face, the shoulder height. Then you, one of the first things you do, if you have a standard chair, you check their arm, uh, their elbow arm length. If this patient sits on a standard uh, chair that 80% of other uh, patients that their elbows touch that armrest and this patient's arm is shorter, that's one great perpetuator for office workers, right? You look at their arm length. You look at their semi-hemipelvis. When they sh sit down, you look at their scapula. When you give them the butt lift, you realize the pelvis is changing. So if they have a small hemipelvis, you have to change the structure by giving them information about 
the butt lift so you don't have perpetuation of mechanical stresses. You check the apex of the scapula. You check the leg lengths. You look at their spine curvature. And also, sometimes the long second metatarsal bones create problems, continuous problems with the tibialis, which goes right up to, uh, the other side of the pelvis, then up to the right, to the other side of the temporomandibular joint, just like a jigsaw. So st when a patient comes to the office, you spend a lot of time examining their posture, and I don't know if that is in your scope, but I do that, and I do that with my therapist, and I make sure I see all that. So we spend over an hour looking at the structural imbalances. So that's why uh, Dr. Travell told me a long time ago, they talk about it, but they don't understand it. You have to spend the time to, to look at all these issues. Structural postural, then myofascial palpatory. Again, depending on your scope of practice, you have to palpate. You have to be able to go in there, palpate the pectoralis muscle. You have to pal you're able to palpate the soleus muscle because the soleus refers to the face sometimes. So palp palpatory skills are extremely important in myofascial treatment. Then you check the range of motion. Then this is in your scope of practice, the dental cranium mandibular examination. You palpate intraoral, extraoral musculature, the radiographs, the head, and the orofacial layer of musculature. Neck and shoulder, because these are so important in TMJ and facial pain. Examination of the four layers of the musculature. Trapezius, the second layer of the neck musculature is the splenia, splenius capitis, splenius cervices. Then you have the semispinalis capitis and semispinalis cervices. Then you have the deepest musculature, musculature of head and neck, the multifidi and the rotators of the head. All of the above actually refer pain to the face, TMJ, etc., which is in the scope of your practice. And a dentist should be able to inject these areas. And these areas are actually more dangerous than just about any other part of the body. So I don't know why if a dentist does myofascial therapy and has proper training, should not be able to inject shoulder muscles and other muscles because you're allowed to inject really with the most dangerous areas and with proper training, you should be able to inject further on with licensing because you are the only one that could, could fix the jaws with the splints, which we'll see a little later on. Intraoral and extraoral musculature, muscles of mastication, and one muscle group that I daren't say most of you miss out, muscles of facial expression, and those thin muscles that you have to spend gentle touch and find the trigger points in the platysma. A lot of patients that they think they have, they have trigeminal neuralgia, what perpetuates trigeminal neuralgia, I've, seen, I've shown this lecture in Arizona 10 years ago, is the platysma. Fine trigger points in the platysma create facial pain that is like trigeminal neuralgia. Zygomaticus major. You go in there, you palpate gently, and you find that fine little trigger, and you inject that. If you find it, serious pain goes away. Ocular muscles, those fine fibers, create facial pain. Neuromuscular occlusion, the journey begins. I did uh, a lot of work in the 70s and basic TMJ work and in the early 80s uh, we started uh, going beyond the scope. We started looking at the head as a bowling ball. These are old, old pictures from 79, 80, 81 and we started venturing into the orofacial and head and neck musculature. We had a study club in British Columbia with a bunch of crazy guys. And these are our drawings. I thought I could share them with you. And then we got involved in research. We all put the money together. And Dr. Bowler, who is one of my greatest mentors, we bought the Myo Monitor and the Kinesiograph. And then this is Jenkelson's Myotronics with all the sophisticated electronics. 
to track the jaw movement. So we bought these machines and we tracked the musculature as we, I showed you in Janet's uh, slides. The dyskinesia and orofacial musculature showed this way. You could see the dyskinesia here. And then after we used the splints and the Maya monitor, and we saw proper movements of the musculature, and we thought this is the answer of myofascial problems. So we were tensing every patient night and day as everything else. The first month, two or three, you get success, you, you somehow 80%, and then suddenly your success goes down. My monitor works, but only works if there's no perpetuating factors. Now, I know that now, but I didn't know that then. So you, you started pulsing these patients and you know, doing the splints. This is the old my monitor. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this machine or own them. And then this was... We used to pulse the patients, and this is before the splint. After you use a splint, you know, we had scientific evidence here. So we go to the board, you know, we could show them before and after. And then we, we were not happy with that. We want to add more frequencies. So a friend of ours who was a, an engineer, Janko Medical, like Dietrich knows, we started designing our own and more sophisticated uh, machines by Jankelson. So, now we are entering in treatment of the temporomandibular joint as dentists. This is a journey in the 80s, 85, 86. Now we are in, in the early 80s, 83, 84, that's when I met Dr. Travell and started changing my life. Temporomandibular joint disorders, muscle attachments, masseter foreclosure, medial pterygoid, temporalis, lateral pterygoid, strap muscles, digastric, geniohyoid, sternohyoid, thyrohyoid. Now, I dare and say that a lot of dentists do not pay a lot of attention to number five. And uh, just be honest to yourself, these pr muscles create a lot of issues in temperamental joint and snoring uh, issues right there. So we should really pay attention to those muscles. And if you look at the anatomy, the direction of the fibers and how they attach, the laxity, of the temporomandibular joint, etc. The lateral pterygoid, temporalis, and I really like these anatomical slides because it tells us how all these muscles in tensegrity, they work together, and the medial pterygoid. And we should not forget that these orofacial musculature the, also harbor many, many trigger points like the frontalis, the orbicularis oculi zygomaticus. Temporomandibular joint disorders, no, not joint, temporomandibular disorders, symptoms. I have found most of the problems in my practice, it's not from the jaw joint, it's from the musculoskeletal issues, loss of vertical dimension, and they all blame it on the temporomandibular joint. You have TMJ pain, headache, ocular pain, otalgia, facial pain, odontalgia, mandibular pain, and throat pain. Signs, muscle spasm and tenderness, just about in every case. Limited opening, click at the TMJ, deviation of the mandible to one side, and you see abnormal wear of dentition. During the examination, you look at the deviation of the mandible while it opens. If you have an anterior displacement of the disc and loss of vertical dimension, you, you cannot get, most of the time, you can't get uh, deviation unless you have loss of vertical dimension. So you look if you, you correct at the midline when you're opening or you don't have correction if you have permanently displaced anteriorly or medially the disc. Vertical opening should be 48 to 52 millimeters and the first 12 to 15 millimeters are you know, rotation, the additional are translation. Lateral excursion 8 to 12 millimeters forcing translation of a condyle on the op opposing s opposite side. You notice if you have a locked disc on the medial side, you cannot go to the, you know, which side the disc is displaced, left or right. These are one of the nice little tools you could have in your office. We c is, you know, you could put it in the chart of a patient, the therabyte, it measures left and right, and the opening, and you put the patient's name in the back, and then in the chart, and you measure the next time. Articular disorders. 
When you see a patient like this, and this has got all the damage in his teeth, he might have temporomandibular joint problems. And you see a patient with all of loss of vertical, with no teeth, you could tell that his uh, temporomandibular joint is in big problem. You have to use all the resources you have, not just myofascial treatments. Now, we're going to concentrate today on the non-articular TMJ disorders, myofascial pain disorders, muscle pain, joint sounds, limitation of jaw opening, uncomplicated by degenerative inflammatory changes in the joint. Myofascial pain dysfunction, etiology, psychophysiologic factors, stress, which is the main cause, tension, depression, malocclusion, premature contact, malalignment of the jaws, the jaw joint accommodates to the teeth. It's not the joint, it's the teeth that created the problem in the joints. Clenching, bruxing, jaw posturing. Then the treatments we have, the standard treatments, physiotherapy, ice packs, trigger point injections, TENS, ultrasound, exercise, biofeedback. I do not use most of these modalities. I'll come to what I use in a few minutes. Occlusal equilibration, psychologic, psychiatric treatments. Drug therapy, skeletal muscle relaxants, antidepressants, sedative, hypnotics, narcotics, analgesic, non-narcotic non, non analgesics. I do not use any of these modalities very rarely. I should not, never say never, but the last few slides, I will show you the modalities that we use very successfully. In our practice, this is how we start. Myofascial therapy, we, after the examination, we start with a sprain stretch with the first myofascial splint as we are teaching the patient what is myofascial therapy. Do some muscle energy, then, the, we, then we go to the trigger point injection and the biological medicine and the homotoxicology. Last year, we talked about homotoxicology and biological medicine with drainage, etc. And also, we stress over and over and over the perpetuating factors. In Dr. Travell's book, it's about 160 pages long, the perpetuating factors. That's why you need a physician, preferably in-house, to work with you on the perpetuating factors. This we call our Red Bible. Structure. Structure is extremely important in my practice. And if I look at it um, in the entire... Uh, musculoskeletal system and microsystem structure comes before function and function goes before form and then form actually as the form changes like this uh, gentleman's teeth you saw or your shoe wears down the form starts affecting the function and the function affects the structure so structure is primary in my office, like the autonomic nervous system. And if you ask me what are the most important nutrients you need is minerals, not for myofascial treatment overall, because minerals are the structural components of your cells. And then comes minerals and metals. Why? Metals are the oscillating, vibrating elements in your cell to create all the chemical reactions. So structure is extremely important. Then comes function, which we will talk about today, the myofascial, which creates the form. This is a lecture I gave in Arizona nine, ten years ago, proprioception and tensegrity. Proprioception, as I mentioned earlier, is extremely important. It's to know where you are in the world, on this planet. If you have no proprioception, you cannot function. Tensegrity. Tensegrity is a relatively new word, and I discovered that in Scientific American publication in 1997-98, which blew me away, changed my paradigm completely. Tensegrity is the maintenance of pattern and architecture. This, we need a whole day to lecture on this, tensegrity and maintenance of pattern and architecture. But I had to uh, talk about this today because it ties in with myofascial therapy, so you get a holistic approach of how muscles work. Tensegrity is a universal structure. If you look at the, the macro and the microstructures, we have patterns that follow tensegrity. It's all tension and compression. And you could see the geodesic domes here. 
all biological beings, organelles, including non-biological matter like water, crystals, all we just found out 10 years ago follow the tensegrity model to a point that they uh, postulate that the entire universe works on tensegrity model, which goes right to the core, to the atoms, and atoms work with the tensegrity model. Like in the geodesic dome of Buckminster Fuller, you get this, the structure with tension and compression. The other form of tensegrity is the pre-stress, which is, uh, we started with an American sculptor called Kenneth Snelson, who has a tension and compression element with pre-stress. In a few seconds, you'll, uh, you'll see the difference. Basically, the concept is the same, but one has pre-stress, the other one has rigid, rigid struts. The skeletal system, which has 206 bones, work the muscle, tendon, ligament, which is the tension, the gravity, compression, the bones, and the tension. Same with the cytoskeleton. Now we have, we know the microfilaments, microtubule, intermediate filaments, wi which connect to the integrins, which are on the cell wall, which adheres to the extracellular matrix. And when I went to university, I did microbiology for four years, we were taught that the cell is just a, a glob of liquid. Fifteen years later, we realized the cytoskeleton has microfilaments and microtubules just like our own skeletons. So the universal pattern of geodesic domes, triangles, hexagons, pentagons, are present in viruses and plants, and every structure in the universe follows the same pattern. And I dare not say that in atomic physics, they follow the same pattern, and it's a duality, just like the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic, parasympathetic, tension, compression. The muscle, tendon, ligament, guy wires, the somatic shape, the, and the microfilaments, microtubules, the intermediate ligaments, the cell shape. So our somatic and cell shape is dependent on the function, which is the tendon, ligament, and the muscle, and the structure, which are the bones. There have been research done by mechanics controlled biochemistry. This is a Michigan State study in the 80s. They, they uh, worked on neurites. When you have damaged nerves, how the nerves repair themselves. And they found out that they repair themselves by using the principles of tensegrity. The microtubules, the microtubules, which happen to be the compression part of the equation when you get hurt, they are, they are wrapped by intermediate filaments. So when you have an injury, the microtubules somehow spring right out and attach to the matrix outside and start the tension and compression as the tissues grow. Then these guys did an experiment in Harvard. They took cells and put the cells, individual cells, in different shapes. They, may, they put them in certain petri dishes with, with Teflon and adhesive, adhesives. When they made the cell be round shaped, okay, the cell stopped multiplying and sent a signal to die, apoptosis. When they flattened the cells, the cells started multiplying. When they changed the tensegrity model on the cell wall, all right? And when they went between the round shape and the flat shape, they differentiated in different tissues. So they realized mechanics control biochemistry. So the tensegrity model, if we go back to our lecture this afternoon, the chaos and the energy. There is no matter. There's light, which creates matter. If there is no light, there is no matter. But if there is matter, what creates the differentiation is the architecture. The architecture of these elements. As we know, both organic and inorganic matter is composed of the same stru structural elements. Oxygen, carbon, phosphorus, nitrogen. It's how these elements are put together that create what 
will happen next. That's why the, the physicists they say there's no such a thing. It's all, you know, it's energy. But, but we are the remnants of that energy. We are the matter. And now we are trying to figure out how we will live this matter in a comfortable way if we have illnesses. Now we're realizing it's not the chemistry, but it is the chemistry. But the preceding, what precedes the chemistry is the architecture. It's a tensegrity model. And us as dentists, again, we really rule with this structure and function, which hopefully I'll show you later, how we get to this tensegrity model with our vertical dimension and how we get the cranium to sit on the shoulder properly. The kinetic chain and the lesion of structure and the autonomic nervous system. About 20 years ago when I was studying with Janet Trevell, we had a convention, a Japanese uh, doctor, Kiyoshi Mayahara, came and gave us a lecture. And, I, and then I showed him how I, I was doing functional appliances, expanding jaws, and we became great friends. And quickly, I have to show you the experiments they did. I'm sure some of you have seen these experiments. What they did, they altered the structure. They got three beagle dogs, and in Japan they do very, very good experiments with uh, uh, the proper litter, etc. What they did, they, to f they found out, this is 1989, systemic effects of the peripheral disturbance of the trigeminal system, influence of the occlusal destruction in dogs. What they did, they ground the right side of the dog's teeth and reduced the vertical dimension by three millimeters. In one week, the mandible shifted to the right, okay? And in no time, because they had probably exposed the pulp, etc., they had fistulas. Then they started seeing autonomic changes. And the autonomic changes were they started changing the luster of the hair, okay? The mandible midline shifted to the, to, to, the, one, to the right side where they lost the vertical dimension. The autonomic failure, they saw loss of hair luster, increased salivation for two weeks after occlusal grinding, probably from the pain. Lacrimation started after three months and remained throughout the experiment. They never stopped lacrimating these dogs. Then one of the dogs had persisted reddish no nodule on the other eye, never went away. Then they had effects on the mo motor system. They started resting tremor for six months. Then they started having up and down movement twice per second in the left hind leg. They ground the right side, loss of vertical dimension on the right side. The left leg goes up and down. Adduction of the left hind leg with pelvic distortion. Then pelvic rotation resulting in unnatu unnatural sitting position. And all of them could not walk straight the rest of the experiment. So these are the changes. They started walking uh, with the pelvis. Look at the, ro they all look the same, the pelvis rotation. And they all sat very unnatural way of sitting on one side. What are we doing? The dental component, the swallow mechanism. I would like all of you, if possible, just swallow, please. When you swallow, which we learned in dental school, we have to seal. If you don't have vertical, proper vertical dimension, you have to put your tongue between your teeth. So I call the swallow mechanism the end point. After I studied osteopathy for many, many years, I realized the swallow mechanism is more important than the cranial rhythm, they call. Uh, because I know I, I'm, I'm older now. I've studied lot much, much more than I knew before. The swallow mechanism is much more important, I think, physiologically than what they call the cranial rhythm, which is very important. But if you don't have, you could do osteopathy on the person till the cows come home. You adjust them. If they don't have proper occlusion, you go out, they have a, a meal, and they swallow. All that goes out. If you're honest, you see that. Now, that's a nice slide. We went Th these are the strap muscles and you have the tongue in between. Can you imagine if the vertical dimension is lost here, what will happen to all this mechanism and the head posture and the temporomandibular joint and all the nerve endings, all the trigeminal uh, 
uh, nerve endings, what will happen to the motor nerve endings, to the autonomic nervous system, as we saw in the slide, the previous slide. Now, why I put these two segments for you? Because to do proper occlusion, you have to use myofascial therapy to find the proper bite. At the end of the, uh, the session, I'll give you a, a big tour of 30 years, how I learned from Peter K. Thomas, basic dentistry, and how I use myofascial therapy to get the right bite. And I haven't changed for 25 years. How to find the proper vertical dimension. And this will be my gift to you, if you, if you like it. How could this individual, with this kind of vertical dimension loss, not have neck problems, autonomic problems, balance problems, as we saw previously in the dogs. So, how do we treat our patients in my office? Mandibular splint therapy, we start usually, most of the time, with myofascial splints, heart splints, then we have the templates, which are, I learned this from the Japanese, which are very, very wide, large splints, and then we have the chewing splints. Of course, we also sometimes we have to use expansion devices and fixed orthodontics like utility arches. Also, we have to use combination of mandibular and maxillary devices. The referred pain, the myofascial component. Now, when the patient comes to you with all these issues, you, they came to see you to make the temporomandibular joint dysfunction and fix their jaws, they usually have referred pain. So you have to understand from these uh, indices where to treat with your needles or with your sprain stretch. Vertex pain is usually sternocleidomastoid, splenus capitis, back of the head pain, you have it all in your notes, trapezius, SCM, semispinalis capitis and cervices, splenius cervices, suboccipital group, occipitalis, digastric, and temporalis. Temporal headache, which most of you see every day, trapezius, SCM, temporalis, splenius cervices, suboccipital group, and semispinalis capitis. Frontal headache is the SCM, semispinalis, frontalis, and zygomaticus major. It's amazing that zygomaticus, zygomaticus major, what an important muscle that is for frontal headache. Ear and TMJ pain. Lateral pterygoid, masseter, suboccipital group, occipitalis, orbicularis oculi, and trapezius. See, right there, this is out of your st standard of care. How could you fix the ear and TMJ pain if you're not allowed to do these? Cheek and jaw pain, again, it's in dentistry, SCM, masseters, lateral pterygoid, trapezius, digastric, medial pterygoid, platysma, orbicular, orbicularis oculi, and zygomaticus. Toothache, temporalis, masseter, and digastric. One little story. Many years ago, I had referred patients from the university. They have root canaled every tooth on this patient's head, including anterior with no. All I did was trigger points. This is literally... 18 years ago at least, the toothaches went away by doing one session of trigger points on the temporalis muscle and masseters. And they had root canal every tooth. And I've seen this a lot of times. A lot of teeth do not, when you have no pathology, they do not need root canals. So you have to do, do intraosseous neural therapy, all the drainage we've I've taught here, and do the myofascial therapy, that will go away. Back of the neck pain, trapezius, multifidi, liberus scapula, spe splenius cervices, and the infraspinatus. Throat and front of the neck pain, SCM, digastric, and medial pterygoid. Now, the SCM, these are the referred patterns from Janet's book. The masseters, you could see they refer to the ears and the teeth. The temporalis, the reason I put the slide, when you're doing temporalis injections, please be careful, palpate, take your time. Don't inject the temporal artery because you could have serious pain with temporal arteritis. You have to be very careful when you're doing the temporalis. The temporalis muscle, in my opinion, creates a lot of pain in the teeth and behind the eye pain. Most of the time is behind the eye pain. Lateral pterygoid and medial pterygoid. And this is a technique how to inject the medial pterygoid. I'll show you later. And the digastric muscle, which is very neglected by our professionals, creates a lot of tooth pain, 
and throat pain. And the fascial muscles, as I told you earlier, the platysma, the zygomaticus, and the occipital frontalis muscle create pain, and from the occiput refers right to the eye. I do. That's my profession. I'm a pain doctor. All day long, I'm doing this. You saw me at the office. That's what I do. Now, these are the four layers. They're very important to know and understand the four layers of musculature. And as I told you earlier, you treat a layer at a time with sequence because it's, it's quite important to do it that way. The trapezius trigger points, the splenius capitis and cervices, they refer pain to the top of the head, etc. Sp seven spinalis cervices, forward, and the rotators. This is a very dangerous area to inject. You have to understand the vertebral artery is there, so uh, Janet did not want anybody to inject this region. When I go and take prolotherapy courses, and <laughs> these guys are putting these long needles very close by, I said, I'm glad Janet is not here watching these guys do this, because she, she was very worried, you know, because she claimed that uh, we only have two arteries, on one, e one on each side. A lot of patients have occlusion in one artery. If you hit the other one, patients die, and she's seen that happen. So you have to be very careful not to hit the vertebral artery. Now the good stuff starts, myofascial therapy. We start with sprain stretch, mus muscle energy, trigger point injections, biological medicine, and homotoxicology. Now, when I do the biological medicine, when, I, when I'm doing trigger point injection, I add a lot of these remedies. As our lecturer this afternoon said about energy medicine, before I start injecting my patients, I give them a big color chart, the seven chakra charts. And the patient, I ask them, which color attracts you today? And they say, yellow. But I really don't like yellow. I don't know why yellow is coming to me. So I take the remedies I'm going to inject. I put it in the E bowl, which is a crystal bowl. I resonate the remedies. I make a sound. And then I use the procaine and the remedies to inject that patient. It's esoteric, but if you agree with, with Emoto and his work, I've been doing that for over 10 years, making sure I resonate my remedies according to my patient's choice. Patients know better than we do, so I always resonate my remedies most of the time, not always, 90% of the time. So palpation is extremely important. You have to flat palpate, take your time learning, and then pinch your palpation, like in the, in the textbook. Flat palpation to find gently the trigger point, and sometimes you could miss that trigger point, so you have to gently come around and squeeze slowly till you find that trigger point. All right? And you just like, as if you're playing the guitar or the harp, you go over the muscle. Palpation, cross fiber palpation reveals top band with a trigger point, like the masseter. Deep palpation along the length of the same muscle fiber feels like a nodule at the trigger point. So that's very important to point. Like you see here, when I'm going across the fibers and when I'm going down the fibers, look with my, th my thumb here, I'm going across the temporalis fibers with my fingers, I am gently finding those top bands, and then I'm pressing a little harder and a little harder till I find a twitch response or the patient says, oh, that hurts. Now then you just don't zero on, then you find the other bands, the one that hurts and starts refer, you are closer to the main trigger point. So palpation is extremely important. As you palpate the posterior cervicals and the sternocleidomastoid muscles, underneath the scapula, and of course, intraoral. You put the gloves on and gently palpate. One of the muscles that creates a lot of pain is called the buccinator. The buccinator harbors a lot of trigger points. It's just like one of those thin muscles, like the platysma, it creates serious mouth and facial pain. So you have to spend time in palpating. 
Then the sprain stretch. We start with the sprain stretch. The seated position is extremely important. Make sure the patient is relaxed. They have to anchor. They have to help you with their arm. Okay. As you spray the the liquid, you have to go to the direction of the pain. Like if you're spraying the trapezius, you have to go towards the pain reference of the trapezius, towards the pain reference of the masseter muscle. Okay, you have to repeat parallel sweeps and not too many sprays, just about four or five sprays in the upper region towards the pain and from the from the lower trapeze, middle trapeze is down the, because it refers pain downward, you spray downwards. This is the old fluoromethane which destroyed the environment. Now we have new. Uh, technology which is friendly to the environment. This is what we use now by the same company. And assistant stretch. Because the patient cannot open their mouth, you put a, an object as much as they can open as you spray, you ask them to help you with their fingers open their mandible. So you don't force yourself. You tell them, as I'm spraying, try to open as much as you can as you are spraying up towards the masseter, towards the ear, and at the same time you're doing the temporalis spray. Guide and protect the patient. You guide the head towards the direction of spray, the stretch. As you see, I'm guiding the head with my left hand, and here when I'm spraying the masseter, I'm protecting the eye. And already we went to you know, a bigger opening. By just spraying the cold on the skin where the autonomic nerve endings are, you are camouflaging the pain and you are increasing the range of motion. If you didn't have the vapor coolant spray on the skin on that area, you will not be able to increase the opening of the mouth. The vapor coolant, which is Janet Travell's mainstay, you do not inject the first appointment. You do the spray and stretch procedures and you spend a lot of time, your assistant, whoever is with myofunctional therapist, we spend a lot of time teaching them how to s stretch afterwards. And very, very, very important, followed by moist heat and home stretch instructions. We use the old-fashioned hydroculator because it's, it starts with very hot, it goes deep heat for 20 minutes, and it really increases the circulation in that area. When you increase the circulation, you detox the musculature, all right? Or you could use the latest technologies like the infrared lasers or whatever you want to use. I prefer at the beginning the moist heat, then you do physics afterwards. Why the moist heat? As I said, you have to increase the circulation in the zone. Then afterwards, second, third appointment, or if you have a crisis, that's when these iodine, anodyne lasers are good, but you cannot replace the moist heat and then we give them the home instructions. This is like the head and neck, you know, the torso, the arms, the shoulders, and the lower segments. We have different stretch sheets, both sides. So, I hope I, like this, what I'm teaching you is a seven year course, like in one hour, like, so like I mean, it's just like. Now, for the dentist, we start with the myofascial splints, we have series of thicknesses. Occlusion, con occlusal contacts depend on the sc skeletal divergencies and t TMJ pathology. That means if you, the more you know orthodontics, the better you're, you're good at this. The first contact, I rock the mandible depending where I have the first contact on that soft splint. I only have one contact on each side because I want to decompress the mandible because they can't open their mouth. These people come, they can only 12, 17 millimeters opening their mouths. So we start with the myofascial splints. Okay, as I said, the occlusal contacts depend on the skeletal divergencies and the TMJ pathology. It's a very rude looking thing, it just works tremendously. It, as they wear this, and we did the sprain stretch, we do osteopathy and various structure manipulation and modalities. If you've done intraoral osteopathy, you stick your finger there and start working on the lateral pterygoid, medial pterygoid. Okay? These are modalities, some osteopathic mod You don't touch the teeth here, just on the palate. And as you soothe the patient, 
okay? You're working on the fascia. Actually, osteopathy is fascial work. It has nothing to do with sutures. It's all fascia, in my opinion. And then you take, you keep that splint in the mouth, and you can see the midline is there, and you take a bite. They close up. I just I did this for the picture for you. This is after several appointments. And then we use that to construct the heart splint, okay? This is, these splint, this slide is at least 20 years old, if not longer, 25 years old. I haven't changed. Take it to the technician and we make some nice teeth with, you know, bicuspid or cuspid rise. And that's what they wear, all right? And these are the templates. Very, very, very thick splints. Like uh, I have a patient, new patient that came to my office. They have orofacial dyskinesia. Nothing stops the dyskinesia. I'm going to start with this. And I have uh, platforms here, like skating rinks. So I'm, I'm completely di dismantling the, the, the craziness of her uh, musculoskeletal system. Like she is going into complete dyskinesia. So I use a template. And as, as you see, we designed this years ago. Like it's like a binator. But it isn't. We have the template, the splint, and if they have class two div one, you have to get their jaw forward at night. I call it, you know, the night activator. I used to I used to have a orthodontic lab because 25 years ago we did not have orthodontic labs that created functional appliances, and my dad used to do functional appliances in Europe, so I had to import a technician to make these for me. Then we could use them on dentures. And sometimes, if you've done orthodontics, the front teeth are in the way, class 2, div 2. As they are wearing the overlay, we, this is a graduate. Like We have like a splint, but we have uh, like metal and uh, acrylic on top. And we're moving the front segment forward. We're doing myofascial therapy we started. Now we have the vertical dimension opening. We're moving the skeleton forward. And we could do orthodontics at the same time. And you can see this is before and then after. Ah, 83, that's a long time ago. This says before and after. Okay? In the meantime, you're doing the myofascial therapy. Now we get to the trigger point injection. So we started with a spray and stretch, moist heat, manipulation, splints. All right? Now we're going into the injection part so we can release the trigger points. Okay? Materials used. Procaine, that's what I... I have not used lidocaine in over 10 years. I use procaine. I call it, no, this is an old slide. Homotoxicological remedies, symptomatic remedies, compound remedies, homocord remedies, metabolic remedies. I use a lot of sonum remedies. Also drainage. Very important, using drainage remedies. Why procaine? I love procaine. I use it intravenously. I use some patients just love procaine. It extends the refractory period of peripheral nerve, so you get more relaxation. Reduces its response to high frequency stimulation. It's the least myotoxic um, anesthetic. Up to two percent. There's hardly any destruction of muscle fiber. It causes local arterial dilatation. That's what we want. We want the arteries to dilate. And it has a reverse effect of caffeine, which is good. Lidocaine potentiates caffeine effect, so I don't use lidocaine. It hydrolyzes rapidly by, proca uh, by procaine esterase in the blood serum and breaks down into paraaminobenzoic acid, which is needed in the synthesis of folic acid by certain bacteria in your gut. So the bacteria in your gut could use it to create folic acid and breaks down to a different element called diethylaminoethanol, which is antiarrhythmic agent. So both agents are good for your patients. All right? So and also displaces calcium abnormally bound to the cell wall. You could see, if you've done dark field uh, microscope, you see sickle cell looking, sickle looking uh, red blood cells. You give them procaine, two cc's, they turn into round red blood cells because of this effect. I've seen it in my office many times. So the basic ones that you should use, we use Tromiel, Lymphomyosote, Circular Heal, Asculus, Pascopril, and now lately we have been using ozone. Ozone injections in certain trigger point areas. 
to excite you a bit more, it, I in only inject ozone. It depends if I need to oxidize a patient or reduce a patient. Some patients need to be oxidized and some patients need to be reduced. That's how we do orthomolecular medicine in our office. You don't always do antioxidants because we are too antioxidized, I think. We need to be reduced or oxidized. Depending what you want to do, you use ozone or the others. All right? 5cc syringe, 27, 25 gauge or 30 gauge, and length as needed. And these are some pictures how you uh, inject the masseter here. Medial pterygoid, they open the jaw, you, you angle it towards that, and this is a lateral pterygoid injection. SCM still and clavicular divisions. And you could follow and the digastric, and you could follow by spray and stretch. After injection, you have to spray, and then you put the moist heat on. Okay, so it's very important to use the moist heat. Home remedies: Tramiel, which and Arnica well. I prefer Arnica well, and yeah, this is a plug. I put this number on. It has Arnica well cream has everything Tramiel has, plus. Ruta, which is great for ligaments for us in TMJ, and Magnesia Foss, which is a painkiller, and Louisa will agree. And it's almost half price of Tromiel. As a matter of fact, this product you could even use in the mouth. It's a gel. So it's called Arnica Well. And the inventor of this was the chief medical officer of Heal for five years, so he knows what he's doing. Arnica Well. It's, it's so inexpensive, and it it's wonderful. All right. Now, this is a little section for the dentist in the crowd. After we get all this done, now we have to do the reconstruction. So we have several ways of doing the reconstruction. So we're going to take you on a tour of specialties very quickly. And the smart guys here will pick it up and take it home. I usually, as you could see, this was four by cuspid extraction. All we had to do was increase the vertical dimension, give them some guides. All right. Or we can use overlays or chewing splints. This is an overlay. I'll show you in a second. It's a chewing splint for a while. While we, we might have to do prolotherapy, we are regenerating the condyle. I could show you slides before and after, three, four years. Complete regeneration of the condyle. Many of them we've done. And if you do it this way, which is, I think, the correct way, you see one side of the mouth completely different than the other because you are... If you come to Bob Walker's lecture on Sunday, you will see how by doing the myofascial work with the splint therapy, you are changing the guy wires of the entire musculoskeletal system, and you should never have one side like the other because it depends which side you lost vertical dimension first and where you, what happened. So this, this is a system I've been doing for over 20 years. You can see one side is different than the other. Now we have the midline on. All right. Now, I combined this with what I learned in the late 70s and early 80s when I did my postgraduate work with like uh, Peter K. Thomas and uh, Cliff Fox and uh, uh, Ohio State University. You're going to laugh, next picture. I had to take this pic. This is when we, I st this is Cliff Fox. This is for the old dentist. We're learning how to do full mouth reconstruction the old fashioned way. Remember these big instrumentations we used to have? I mean, come on, how could you, how this work? You start wrong, you're finishing wrong. You're taking the, the measurements when the mandible is open. You have these two templates in the mouth, you're trying, I mean, you are not starting where the center of, of the condyle is. Okay, the pantographic tracings. How could this be correct? Because you're starting with the mouth open. You're not starting with the mouth closed. So, but we learned a lot. We learned about articulators, all right? And this is a dentist, actually. He was. <laughs> this guy is a dentist, and uh, that's his mouth, and we learned how to you know, wax up teeth and do fill mouth reconstructions. And this is a case in the 80s I did. I followed the same principle I, I showed you earlier. A lot of headaches, no vertical dimension before and after. And I'll show you how we got there. He comes to the office. He's got a lot of wear. We did the myofascial spent treatments, and I showed you all afternoon. We got to this stage. All the wear in the teeth, wear in the teeth. Now he's very happy. Everything is working. The mouth is opening fine. And this is where his teeth are. Now we have to do full mouth reconstruction. 
This is a postgraduate course in prosthodontics coming up. So we mount the case. This is something I created. I asked Danar Corporation to make me a, a table for, to do this. So I mount the splint. How much accurate than this can you get? You put the splint. All right. And then these are the tables that I asked them to make for me because I know the CEO. So we mount this table and I grind the table a bit. We put the acrylic and as I move the articulator, I'm following exactly what the patient has in his mouth for months and he's doing just fine and I'm changing all the parameters in the articulator. Okay? You can see that as it's liquid form as it hardens. So I have all the guides. So we do the front teeth first. Okay? So we do the front teeth, prep the front teeth. All right? So we do the front teeth, but he has a splint on the back. Right? Then we do one side. Remember in the olden days, we used to have all these nice gold pins. Yeah. I still think gold is fantastic. So. And then that's the case. You know. So I use myofascial work to do reconstruction, and I haven't changed for over 20 years. That's my little secret. So I, the, you can't get a patient get come forward, back, you know, the hinge location, the way we were taught all over, like it just doesn't work. You have to work with the splint, get the range of motion right, the condyle right, recon reconstruct the condyle, and then you do the full mouth reconstruction. Cuspid rise, all right, after. Before, look how nicely open the vertical dimension after. All right. You know, this is the way myofascial works for me. So I don't think you could do full mouth reconstruction as a prosthodontist if you don't understand the tension component of the tensegrity model. You do the compression all the time, all the hard tissue, but you really have to know how to deal with the soft tissue. Soft tissue is extremely important. Like, if you, if you guide the tensegrity model, the muscle fibers, that's how the bionators work, how the jaw works. So we have to follow the tensegrity model as you do the full mouth reconstructions. You get a patient like this in severe pain. They've done new crowns, and that's how it is. Look how worn down he's got crowns. He's got serious pain. This is 10 years ago. The other case was in the 80s. You could see from his posture. Look how much I opened him up. That's pretty big, don't you think? These are the splint therapies, etc. This is the anteriors. Look how open is the back. All right? I chose to do big, huge buildups on him, and this is the end. All right. So, just one little final note. Take your time, learn how to do sprain stretch, learn about the perpetuating factors before you do myofascial treatments. Take some good courses. I don't know who teaches it now. I don't think, I don't know if anybody teaching it properly. <laughs> yeah. I just have a question for Ara. Um, I'm so curious with all the proprioception and the autonomic nervous system and everything that's going on with, with trigger points in the face, of what the effects are of Botox? Great question, because uh, there is not a week now that I don't get a patient that comes to my office and says, can I get my smile back? Can you fix me up? I think Botox, uh, I'm, maybe I'm being too hasty, it's not good for you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, last week, I had a patient from Switzerland, and they've been doing Botox injections on this trapezius and posterior cervical muscles at $800 a session. Whew, they charge a lot in Switzerland. We should move there. Um, when I injected, when I checked those muscles, totally different uh, feeling. The muscle fibers have changed dramatically. So what happens, uh, uh, to answer your question in a different way, once I went to... Uh, 
I slept wrong one day and I, and I kicked my neck and I went to the gym and I had no power in my tri in one tricep. So I looked at my physician, my physician was at, my, my, at the gym with me, I was training him. I said to him, give me pain, I don't want paralysis. So the, the nervous system, electricity rules. The body does everything. If, you, if we were at last year's convention, one of our keynote speakers said the body, the brain rules. Every, the body does anything to detox to get the nervous system going. So the Botox is destroying the signaling of the nervous system. And what happens in the tensegrity model? It's worse in a way, as bad in a different way than you lose vertical dimension. So the nerve endings, there is no end point in that, uh, in that bursa. So I find uh, patients uh, also psychologically, they cannot express their feelings. Uh, ladies in their 40s and 50s, they cannot laugh with their friends anymore. It's creating emotional problems. So uh, don't sign me up on Botox. So that's what I see. Changes in the muscles, and patients don't like it. And by the way, the pain doesn't go away. Doing research on the protein structure of the cell, as I've done and Dr. Haley has done, and I'm not going to speak for Dr. Haley, even though he's a very close friend and colleague, we have not found a neurotoxin like Botox, root canal toxins, mercury, that does not completely annihilate the proteins of the nucleotide binding protein chain. And these proteins are proteins that bind to the cellular structure in our DNA to where the cell structures can perform a function. And Botox is definitely one of those neurotoxins that will absolutely destroy these intercellular proteins. So you gotta be really careful what you're, what you're putting in your body. I forgot to ask the, the other part of the question, which was that there are so many patients that are taking medications that have side of, neurological side effects and affect, affects the balance. Um, and I think that um, a lot of the statins, I think, um, affect balance, and some of, a lot of the cardiac medications, and I'm trying to think um, exactly which ones, but I, they do have, um, you know, I, I think, is it, amy, is it amiodoral? That affects the balance. And of course, a lot of these patients, since they are cardiac patients, also have loss of, of vertical dimension in teeth because of periodontal disease. So how, how are you dealing with people that are coming in with all of these side effects from medications that also have uh, the medical problems? As I mentioned earlier, we have a, a, a boutique clinic. So we, we use, we start with the dental component, let's say, and um, for the balance, we start detoxification. We do a lot of tests with the physicians, but one of the main muscles, two muscles, trapezius and the SCM, we have 12 cranial nerves. We only have 12 cranial nerves. One of the cranial nerves, 11, supplies just two muscles, nothing else. So the SCM is the most incredible proprioceptive muscle. One of the first things we do, if they have a vertical dimension problem, uh, which they usually do, we start with this SCM treatment. When we do the injections on the SCM, we don't go deep in the muscles first. We do, like if you've studied with Dietrich, we do sigmetal therapy on those muscles first, and then we start the detoxification program depending on their history. And then we also use sonum remedies, and we also have uh, a, a pharmacy in, in Toronto that makes specific amino acids. So we do a lot of orthomolecular medicine. We detox, we give them IV bags, we start uh, myofascial therapy. And slowly, we do not remove amalgams, et cetera, right away. We just slowly build up the patient and we do neural therapy, myofascial therapy to get their balance back. While you're coming up to ask a question, I got one for uh, Dr. King. Um, can you write too much information in a chart? Yes and no. Uh, you should write as much in the chart as possible again so that if you had amnesia or anybody else that was never in your office, they could read the chart and understand 
what you did and why and what materials you used. However, when it gets to considering modalities that aren't considered conventional, then you have to be careful of what you put in the chart because then too much information is going to hurt you really bad. Um, and, and the words you use are even very important. Uh, for instance, you're using uh, electrodermal screening, kinesiology, whatever, and you say um, this test um, shows something, shows decay. You have to say something like this test is suggestive of decay because then it's just maybe it is, maybe it isn't, uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not black and white, it, it's suggestive. And then along with the other conventional information that you have, you use all that information just like you would for anything else to make a diagnosis. But if you just go say, yep, loss of vertical dimension over here, and that's the only test you use, you're not using measurements or anything else, you're in big trouble. Taking the cultural setting that we have, I recently read a report that uh, numbers of uh, particularly younger women who were complaining of tic de la Roe were found to uh, be completely relieved of pain with the removal of the uh, piercing in their tongues. And uh, my question then is, what are the implications of oral and, and labial and other facial, orofacial type piercings with regard to metal-metal interactions, uh, electrical interferences, whatever with regard to dental health. Who wants to handle that one? Raise your hand, come on. Well, the answer is boring. It's obvious if you've taken courses in neural therapy, first of all, the scar uh, and creates a whole bunch of interference fields and then the, the heavy metals create heavy metal toxicity. And I mean, uh, it's a, sorry, it's a no-brainer, you just, you treat them like, uh, but if they wanted, they're like, okay, my daughter <laughs> wanted a tongue pierced, so you can't fight them, right? So I said, go ahead, do it. Did it. Then uh, they have to go through the journey, then realize, hey, this is not right, so no more, it's gone, and we treated her. So you, you have to, it creates an interference field. Some people more than others. It seems to me, but some people love interference feel in their heads. They cannot live without interference. It's true. I'm wondering, you know, a lot of it is about regulations and authority. I'm wondering how the, uh, in terms of OSHA, for our people that work in the office, it seems to me the mercury exposure for employees is a very big issue that the can of worms have not really opened up yet. And I'm wondering how a state board would approach um, protecting, like we're talking about protecting the public and a lot of the protocols for mercury removal, also for our staff, because we go through a lot of fairly intensive protocols. And yet, in the state board terms, it's almost like this doesn't exist, even though we can see the mercury vapor, even though we can measure it, even though we know it crosses the blood-brain barrier, placental barrier what would the state board's approach be in terms of an OSHA claim going in their direction? I don't know. <laughs> first, of, first of all, a um, couple thoughts come to mind. The board has limited resources in time. And also, generally speaking, at least that's the way it's supposed to be, we don't go fishing, we don't go on an expedition, we can only uh, deal with complaints that we receive. So if nobody is complaining to the board about conditions in the dental office, we're not gonna go out and look for it. Um, I can't think of a claim in, in the time I've been on the board of, of, of such a nature. Um, if it did come in, um, I would venture to say they would say that's a federal issue, non-jurisdictional for the board, referred on to the OSHA, which then just goes into a dark hole. Um, <clears throat> I have another one for you, Ron. Um, 
at a time right now when our privacy rights um, are a big issue and yet our government is trying to comp you know, have more and more information, including where we spend every dollar, um, a lot more personal information is being gathered. And I'm wondering what, what you sense, not necessarily regulation-wise, is that the purpose of the HIPAA regulations is really about. I used to know what the purpose of HIPAA is supposed to be. Um, I think it's mostly about transmission of personal health information electronically because that can be used and misused. It can go out to cyberspace and used by anybody who wants it. So. The government is trying to protect the public, but the ramifications of HIPAA go beyond whatever they intended. Um, I, I guess that's my only answer. I, I, again, that would be considered a federal jurisdiction, and the boards would not want to deal with it. I was just going to comment, uh, ask your dental assistants if they'd like to go to work in a hazmat suit and a gas mask, and when they don't want to, have them sign a release. The, the issue that Steve's bringing up is something that I've talked to my staff, and, you know, and they're here. Hygienists are here. Uh, my, I have two of them. They're wonderful, wonderful uh, practitioners and a great team member. But I've told them over and over again, if a tooth has a mercury filling in it, don't polish it because you're releasing mercury. Now, sometimes I'm talking to deaf ears, but that it is a real, real concern of mine. Um, in this day and age of uh, thoughts and understanding and words, Roger, could you tell us uh, what the effect of prayer prior to work? I know every time uh, I do surgery on patients and even before I do work, I always say a personal prayer and sometimes share that with a patient and what your opinion would be of the power of that suggestion? Well, actually, the, the vast majority of patients I pray for in the office, um, it's just my personal belief that patients really appreciate the fact that you think enough about them that you are praying to God over their health condition. So it's been a practice of mine for many years to do that. There's a few patients that really don't care to have you do that. I am in the Bible Belt in Arkansas, so it's not too difficult. There are probably some areas that wouldn't go over as well as it is there, but I'd say probably 99% of the patients that I see are very comfortable with that and then deeply appreciate it, some with tears in their eyes afterwards, because I think that in reality, when you touch a person on the physical level, it's one thing. When you touch them on the emotional and spiritual level, you've gone much deeper with those individuals. And most patients, we only get to the physical level. And I think they really want to connect with you spiritually and emotionally. So that, I think, is a, is a, is a tremendous ability that if you can do that, connecting with patients emotionally and, and spiritually with them, I think you can do a, a great deal more for them. I mean, maybe it's only a placebo effect. Hey, when a placebo effect works, it works, regardless of how it works. So, yeah. I have a question for Dr. Mimoli. Uh, what's the role of a dentist when it comes to a patient who has Lyme disease? Where do we start with it? The what we basically found is that Lyme disease, depending on how people are affected by it, you're going to see um, a, a lot of caries, all right? And that's, that's usually what we see in the younger people. In adults, we don't really see that. Uh, at least I don't see it that much. Uh, kind of what I see is the Lyme is going to gravitate towards those areas where the, really the immune system can't get to it, like in the focal areas. Uh, in non-vital teeth uh, and the like. And it, it's really hard to get in those areas unless you actually go in there. And, you know, I have people who 
uh, I know, okay, and I can't say I refer to them or anything, but they treat a lot of these things energetically, and it's, it's very persistent. And again, that's why I say getting back to causation therapy, building up the immune system, the nutrition, it needs to be the whole picture. I, don't, I hope I answered your question. It's not, it's not an easy topic and how we can treat it because it is a multidisciplinary action that has to take place and it starts with lifestyle with the parents. I'm a naturopathic physician, so I refer to people like you all for your expertise. And I'm wondering, why are dental visits so volatile? I mean, sometimes I refer to somebody who I'd completely trust, and the, the uh, office visit gets ex extremely inflamed, and the patient comes off you know, hating the dentist or whatever. I mean, what is going on that's so volatile? A quick answer to a very long question. Uh, it, part of it depends on the style of the dentist, all right? And part of it depends on the, I think, the emotional state of the person when they go there. A lot of them, as you saw, have been to two or three different dentists. One person, the dentist laughed in my face, okay? You know, they're coming into my office. You know, I'm seeing these people when I first meet them. There's, there's a lot of coldness, and it takes a while for them to trust you. And you really have to have a feel for people to know how much you know you can expect from them. Sometimes in my first visit, it takes me an hour to do the uh, history, you know, to get to the to the bottom line for that patient. To, before I get in their mouth, I try to make sure that we have a connection before I even look in the mouth. Uh, also, there are lots of variabilities in treatment plans. Some dentists see that you should change this filling. Others say, no, it's fine. If they've gone to two, that's what starts all the problems. Variability in treatment planning, huge. For example, if a dentist is into periodontal disease, no, no, you, get, you have to get your gums right first. If the other guy is into removing amalgams, then you know, that's what's variability. And the last part I'd like to add to that answer is sometimes uh, the patients just do not want to accept the responsibility that something is wrong. And uh, I get tremendous amounts of referrals from naturopaths, which I certainly appreciate. But uh, personality can enter into it. Uh, and many of these patients that come in are very, very toxic, and they do not remember what you tell them. That's why everything we do in the office, I want to see a consent form that is signed, that shows all the variables, and I'll go over that tomorrow. What I've seen in the last year or two years, because I get involved in lawsuits that I shouldn't be in, but uh, we end up with patients that or you ever, as a physician, or maybe I've referred to a, to a dentist that I trust, and the patient doesn't like what the dentist is telling them, okay? The, patient, the patients have been so emotionally involved, and women are the worst about this, they get so inverse to their teeth that you go in and you say, well, man, you've got root canals, the topaz tests that are toxic as hell, the cavitat shows they've got ischemic osteonecrosis in the bone, you're going to lose seven teeth. Oh, my God. I mean, the woman comes, goes ballistic, and then she goes out and, and, and she, oh, I'm not going to disfigure me. I'm... I'm going to be a dental cripple. Well, where'd that word come from? Dental cripple. I mean, Jesus, the woman didn't walk in the office. She was pushed in in a wheelchair. I mean, <laughs> so you, this, is, this, is what you're, this is what you're up against. I mean, uh, you know, you've got, you've got emotions because they're so attached to the teeth because they've been lied to by the American Dental Association and all their associates for 100 years now. Mercury is not harmful. Root canals are safe, you know. I couldn't agree with you more, Bob. <laughs> See, Bob can say that. He won't lose his license. <laughs> okay, well, bless your heart, Bob. Uh, I'd like to have Ron King's uh, comments on this, but it, I'm going to allude to some of the things Bob did. And I don't know if Minnesota has been free from quackbuster influence, but my state of Wisconsin has certainly infiltrated the bureaucrats on the board. And so how, as a practitioner, do you protect yourself, as Bob is saying, 
Aetna is influencing quackbusters who are going to the boards and creating problems for practitioners. I think this is a question uh, for Ron, and then I know Bob's going to want to get the last word. <laughs> I'm proud to say that Quackbusters has not had any influence whatsoever in our board work. Um, the other question, because I must be Mercury Talks, what was the second part again? How do you protect yourself? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I always give all the options that I can think of, uh, both the options that an American Dental Association dentist would give and the options that a, an alternative biologic dentist would give. I just lay it all out. It's just like they're coming into a restaurant, you give them a menu. Regardless of whether you believe it or not, regardless if you perform it or not, you give them all the options. You give them the benefits and the risks of each, probably give them some cost estimates, uh, and you let them decide. And you document that you did so. I just assumed that everybody was, all you dentists were like my dentist at home. He has this picture. On one side, it's these ugly amalgams, and on the other side, beautiful white teeth, and he says, which would you rather have, this one or this one? I just assume everybody else had that. It's just the uh, pathway of getting there. Okay, thank you all for a fantastic uh, presentations. <laughs>